thank you for the word of the Lord this morning. He will honor his word. He will stand by his promises. Thank you for the word of the Lord this morning. There's promises in this book we can hold on to, amen? I'm gonna stand firm on the word of God and I claim my promise. I was just talking with Brother Bogard this morning. He's had a pain in his body for the last two weeks and God just instantly healed him this morning. We serve a miracle working God. With his stripes we are healed. That's a promise and he met his promise this morning. With his stripes we are healed. Brian Mosley got to go home and receive his healing. God honors his promises. Roger Allison's watching this morning and needs our prayers. We prayed for him this morning already. But I serve a covenant keeping God. I don't know that outcome. That belongs to God and God alone. But I know he's a promise keeping God. That's what I do know. I stand firm on God's word this morning, claiming victory in every single one of our circumstances and situations in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you, worship team, for leading us to the throne room this morning. The presence of God is here. Hallelujah. You can make your way back to your seats. You can be seated this morning. Powerful presence of God that is here once again. Meeting us here every Sunday, it seems. It'd be very easy as the preacher to step aside because God is ministering in, in mighty ways. I do believe I have a word from the Lord this morning before I, I get into that. I want to echo once again what Bishop said about tickets. If you have not purchased your tickets for Messiah, please do so. But I do want to mention about Messiah. He mentioned it yesterday. This week that is ahead of us is a very difficult and trying week. The cast and the technical team and everybody gives of themselves greatly over the next week because we are just uh, a week and a half away from our first performance. So please, 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 those of you that are not involved in Messiah, if you don't mind uh, praying and maybe spending an extra day this week pushing away from the table fasting and giving of yourself, praying for this cast that God will strengthen them this week because it is a very difficult week ahead and Messiah is going to be tremendous this year. And I believe it's going to make an impact on our community like never before. Bear with me this morning. I won't promise you that I will be done in the quickest manner, but I do feel like I have a word from the Lord. I thought I had this word from the Lord two weeks ago, and God said it wasn't the right time, and He stepped in, and we had a tremendous service two weeks ago, and then a great message from Bishop last Sunday, but I, I believe I've heard from the Lord this morning and want to share what He's placed on my heart today. I do hope that everybody here, under the sound of my voice, and those of you watching by way of the web, for that matter, understands how important you are to the kingdom of God. Hope you understand how important you are to the POA. Um, that you have talents and you have giftings and you have abilities and you play an intricate part, an intricate, you have an intricate role in the POA and in the kingdom of God. You matter. You make a difference. There are people all throughout our community that my giftings, my talent, my personality, my circle of friends, whatever it may be, I can't reach those people. And there are people that need you, your personality, your gifting, your talent, your ability. Everybody under the sound of my voice has the opportunity to play an important role in God's kingdom. I hope you understand that, just how special you are. If you don't know it, the enemy knows it. The enemy knows how powerful you can be. The enemy knows how effective you can be. The enemy knows that God called you, that God gave you, yes, you, a specific set of skills and personalities and talents and giftings 
that are meant to reach somebody that your neighbor cannot reach. The enemy knows it. And he will do everything he can to stop each and every one of us from fulfilling what God has called us to be. Everyone under the sound of my voice has a gifting from God that God intends us to use for His kingdom. The question is, will we let Him? And this is not my text this morning. This is just the precursor to where I'm headed. But Romans 12, 4 through 8 says, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. We all have different gifts. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith or ministry. Let us wait on our ministry. He that teacheth on teaching, he that exhorteth exhortation. He that giveth, let him do so with simplicity. He that ruleth, let him do so with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Everybody has a gifting, a talent, an ability, a role to play in God's kingdom, a role to play here at the POA. And it may look different than the person sitting next to you, but everybody has a gift that is meant to be used for God. And God says as much. When we look in His Word, is there anybody here today, if you have any spiritual perception at all, is there any one of us that can read, read Paul's declaration of God's purpose for our life and not breathe a sigh of relief? And I turn you to our text this morning, which is Romans 8, 28 through 34. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them that are called according to his purpose. How can we read that verse and not get excited about what has just been told to us? That if God is the captain of our ship, then all things work together for good. The good, the bad, the ugly, the good choices, the bad choices, the mistakes. That doesn't give us free reign to just go make a bunch of bad choices and say, well, God will take care of it. We have to live with consequences of bad choices. But the fact still remains, God takes everything, the good, the bad, the ugly, and he works it for our good. How can we not get excited about a verse like that? Paul continues, for whom he did foreknow. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, he also called. And whom he called, he justified. And whom he justifies, he also glorified. That ought to make us feel real good about ourselves this morning. If we've been battling with self-valuelessness or self-worthlessness, that scripture ought to bring a joy to us this morning that ought to make us feel real good. That God, not anybody else, God ordained you to be here right now. He called you right here, right now. He ordained, he predestined, he called so that we could be justified through faith justification through faith. I'm justified by my belief in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ tells me to be justified through his word that I must have the death, the burial, the resurrection. I must repent of my sins. I must be baptized in his name for the remission of those sins. And I must be filled with the Holy Ghost, evidence in speaking in other tongues. That is my justification through faith leading me towards my eternal glorification. Called, predestined, ordained, justified, glorified. Knowing all of that, Paul has confidence to go on and say, what shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against 
us. I'm called, I'm predestined, I'm ordained, I've been justified, I'm headed towards my glorification, I'm getting a new body one day. In fact, Scripture tells me I will be like Him. So what shall I say then to these things if God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up also for us all. How shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? If He took on flesh and died for us, you think He won't give us anything we ask for? For our betterment? For our good? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is He that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Jesus is praying for you. What a thought. It's one of the most powerful portions of Scripture in all the Bible. It's one of the most powerful portions of Scripture that Paul gives us. That is God's glorious design for our lives, individually and collectively. We are foreknown, predestined, called, justified, glorified. Paul has clearly articulated God's intent for us. Known, called, ordained, justified, glorified. He goes on to ask a rhetorical question after he gives us that portion of Scripture. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who or what can keep those beautiful promises? Called, ordained, justified, glorified, Known, who can keep those promises from finding fulfillment in my life? He asks that rhetorical question and then he answers it with another question. Shall tribulation or distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? No, he says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Realize it doesn't say through his love keeps us from all things. He says in all these things, in tribulation, in distress, in persecution, in famine, nakedness, peril, or sword, literally or figuratively, in all of these things that we will face. No doubt about it. In this life, you shall have tribulation in all these things. The love of Christ does not keep us from these things, but the love of Christ helps us to endure in all these things. Stronger than any or all of these things which we may encounter in this thing we call life, stronger than them all is the love of Jesus Christ. It's what keeps us. It's what strengthens us. Though we may face tribulation, though we may face distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword, through all of those things we are made stronger, more than conquerors. Why? Because of the love of Jesus Christ. Paul continues, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. No height, no depth, no other creature shall be able to separate us from the very thing that sees us through our trial, our valley, and our difficulty. The love of Jesus Christ. Not death, not life, not angels, not principalities, not powers. There's no fallen angel. There's no evil spirit. There's no devil in hell. None are to be feared. They cannot keep you from the love of Jesus Christ. There is no height. There is no pinnacle of success. I will never be so successful that I can outrun the love of Jesus. There is no depth. There is no oppression. There is no depression. There is no bondage so great that the love 
of Jesus Christ cannot manifest itself in your life. There is no creature. There's no individual. There's no man. There's no woman. There's no beast of the field that can keep God's love from my life. He continues, no present thing, no matter what I'm going through right now, the circumstances of life that I'm facing right now, no matter how out of control, it's out of my control, nothing in this present world can keep God's love from me. Nor things to come. There is no future so dark in my life that God's love can't reach me. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do. I will not fear what governments can do. I will not fear how society may try to ostracize me. It will never separate me from the love of God, which makes me more than a conqueror. Paul has run the gauntlet. He has seemingly identified every imaginable saboteur of our salvation. Creatures above, on, and below the earth. He's explored the heights, the depths, the present, the future, and he concludes that none of these things can conquer Christ's constraining love over my life. But conspicuously absent from Paul's otherwise exhaustive list of things that can separate us from the love of God, we've got heights and depths and creatures and presents and futures. But exempt from his list is the past. He never mentions the past. When he's identifying those powers or people whose best efforts is to undermine us spiritually, they will ultimately fail. He ignores the past, and not without consequence, because more often than not, it is precisely that, the past, that we allow to smother our faith, hold us hostage, neutralize our effectiveness in the kingdom of God, we allow the past to steal our gifting. Sometimes we even allow the past to bring about our own premature spiritual demise. Too often for too many, it is the past. It's the past that raises the white flag of surrender over our present. It is the past that casts such a long, dark shadow over our future. It is somebody or something or somewhere from the past. So absent from Paul's list of predators whose efforts is to separate me from the love of God, they will ultimately fail. Absent from his list is the past. So I'm here on this Sunday morning doing my best to motivate all of us that we can, we must shoot an arrow of death through the heart of that terrifying foe called the past. We can begin this morning by proclaiming that we know the truth. And because I know the truth, I am free. The truth is that it was the Son who made me free and who the Son sets free is free indeed. I am no longer bound to my past. I'm no longer bound to the hurts and the mistakes and the faults and the failures and the guilt and the shame. I no longer have to hear the echoes of my accusers. I am free by the blood of Jesus Christ and whom the Son sets free, is free indeed. I'm free. If we are going to deny the past the power to plunder our present, or God forbid, sabotage our future, we must learn to let it go. 
let it go. And I know, I know there are unimaginable pains in this room. I know it's very easy for me to get up here and scream, let it go, when you've walked your valley. I know what's in this room. I know there are people who have been abused mentally, physically, emotionally as kids. I, I know that there are people who have had circumstances in their life tear them down. I know that there are people in this room who, due to a bad decision, is living under so much weight of condemnation. I know it's very easy for me to say, let it go, but it doesn't change the fact. We've got to let the past go. It's trying to ruin your present. It's trying to take away your present. What God wants to do for you now. I know there are hurts in this room. I'm not trying to belittle those in any way. I'm sorry for the ramifications they have caused on your life, the consequences that they have placed on your life. I'm not belittling you. I'm not saying that you shouldn't have pain or hurt, but we've got to let the past go. I'm reminded of my favorite Disney cartoon. Well, Aladdin's probably my favorite. It's right there with the Lion King. And the remakes are terrible, by the way. But we all know the certain scene in The Lion King where Simba says, if I go back, I'll have to face my past. And Rafiki smacks him on the head. Boom. Ow! What was that for? It doesn't matter. It's in the past. Yeah, but it still hurts. Oh, yes. It can hurt. But the way I see it, you can either run from it or learn from it. We've got to let it go. We must learn to live in the here and now. Clinging too tenaciously to yesterday to some experience or event, whether for good or for evil, whether spent in righteousness or wrong, is a malady that can itself in us all. Unless Paul's powerful commentary on the past, which is spoken with an eerie silence in his curious omission, lest it find fulfillment in my life, I've got to learn to let it go. I gotta learn to live in the here and now. What is God doing now? What, how does God want to use me now? I've got to let go of the past and figure out what, what's God trying to do with me now? How does God want to use me now? How can I learn from that so that God can use me now? The greatest theft of this precious gift that we have called the present is when we allow yesterday's shadows to drive the light away. We must be aware, you and I, or that wily adversary of us all, Satan himself will work his wicked way upon us. He is trying his very best to keep us from the today. He wants to keep me from today's mercy. He wants to keep me from today's benefit. He wants to keep me from today's strength. He wants to keep me from today's blessing. He wants to keep me from today's anointing. All of those promised by God in this book, this Bible has promised me that I've got mercy, I've got benefit, I've got strength, I've got blessing, I can be anointed, I'm promised in this word. But the devil's doing everything he can to keep me stuck in the past, not obtaining today. He's trying to stick us by immobilizing us in the mire of some unresolved relationship from the past, maybe stuck in the chains of a poor life decision, shackled down by some mistake or misappropriation or failure. I say, God forbid, not today, devil. You may have stole some of my yesterdays, but you're not getting my today. You may have taken some of my past, but you're not getting my today. You're not gonna cast the shadow over my future. I'm not going to allow my past to separate me from what God wants to do in my life.
Once again with the Apostle Paul, I join and I say, if I don't do anything else, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth for the things which are before. I'm going to forget about the yesterdays, the pain, the hurt, the agony, the struggle, and I'm going to press on towards the mark. I'm going forward towards the high calling of Jesus Christ. I got to let go of some yesterdays so that I can push forward towards what God has for me. I'm moving forward. I'm not going to stay stuck in the past. It's trying to separate me from God. I'm moving forward, enemy of my soul. First Samuel 16, we hear God cautioning his faithful servant, Samuel. How long do you plan on mourning for Saul, Samuel? Seeing that I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. How long are you going to stay back there, Samuel? In short, God's telling Samuel, Saul is old business. I'm done. I'm through with Saul. How long do you plan on mourning, Samuel? I've rejected him. It's in the past, Samuel. It's time to move on. The message to the man of God is this. If you're going to stay up with me, if you're going to stay in lock, stop, and barrel with me, you better quit focusing on the yesterday hurts. I know y'all were close, Samuel. I know that you anointed him. I know y'all were best friends. I know you probably feel like his failure is also your failure. I know that, Samuel. I know you want to stay stuck wondering what you could have done different. Could you have said something different? Could you have prayed a different prayer? Could you have given a different word? I know you want to stay stuck in the past, Samuel, but I'm moving forward. I'm moving on, Samuel, and you better do the same thing. Matter of fact, Samuel, if you keep lingering back here, you're going to miss out on what I'm wanting to do in the here and now. So here's what I want you to do, Samuel. Go fill your horn with oil. Go fill your horn with oil. I'm sending you somewhere. I want you to go to Jesse the Bethlehemite's house. I've provided myself a king among his sons. And to Samuel's credit, he left the past behind. He moved forward. He did what God told him to do. He took his horn of oil. He anointed David in the midst of his brethren. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Saul was old news. God had moved on. Samuel needed to do the same thing, and he did. We can't stay stuck in the past. We must let it go. In the midst of a discussion about his second coming in Luke 17, seemingly out of nowhere, Jesus says, Remember Lot's wife. Only three words but they teach a lesson enough for a lifetime. He's talking about his return. Swift, like lightning in the sky. Like the days of Noah before the flood. Like the days of Lot before fire rained. Then out of nowhere, remember Lot's wife. There are lots of other things to remember from that story that Jesus could have highlighted. He could have highlighted Abraham's prayer of intercession. What a prayer. Prayed for his family. Went after his family. Sought God for his family. And God heard. Jesus could have talked about that. He could have talked about how powerful it was that angels from on high were sent to save Lot and his family out of Sodom. Leading his family away before the fire was about to fall. But what Jesus chooses to highlight is how someone broke the command, don't look back. That's the issue. Looking back. She looked back and was turned into a pillar of salt. We don't even know her name. Lot's wife. Unable to refrain herself from looking at her past. It caused her to lose her future. She wanted to live 
I'm sure she was excited about the next step in the journey of life. I'm sure she was planning a great future with her family. She was fleeing with them just as the others were fleeing. But the pull of her past was strong enough for her to turn her head, make her look back. And she lost her present and she lost her future because she couldn't quit looking at her past. And we can lose our present. We can lose our future as well if we are beholden to our past. Jesus Himself says in Luke 9, 62, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. We can't live this life looking back. It will separate us from the very thing that helps us to overcome the love of Jesus Christ. Not by His doing, but by our own. We can go get so eat up with condemnation and guilt and shame about our yesterdays that we cannot experience the love that God has for us today. The past is that powerful. And Paul the Apostle knew it. That's why it's missing from his list of heights, depths, creatures, present, future. Paul knew the power of lingering in the past. The bronze serpent in the wilderness... It was a symbol and a precursor to the cross of Jesus Christ raised by Moses in the wilderness, worked signs, wonders, and healing of those that were bit by the venomous snakes. If you looked on it, you were cleansed of your venom. It was a depiction of what Jesus Christ would do through His blood on the cross. But through the years, it became superstitiously venerated. King Hezekiah realizes that the people are worshiping it, and he destroys it, calling it just a piece of brass. Some people spend their lives looking back either negatively in regret, but we can also get stuck looking back positively in nostalgia. We hear it all the time. Remember the good old days? I love the good old days. I'm thankful for the good old days. Church has been here since 1950, having revival. I love what God has done here. I love the truths and the principles that we are built upon. I love this apostolic gospel. I love that Jesus is the only way and that you must repent of your sins and that you must be baptized in his name, that you must be filled with his spirit. Go read John 3 if you have trouble believing that. I love our apostolic truths. I love what we stand for. I love that we are separate from this world. I know we are in, but we are not of. I love that we look different, we act different, we're made fun of, we're talked about, we're persecuted. I love all of those things. I love our past. I love the revival that G.A. Mangan had. I love the revival that Anthony Mangan has had. But I am not going to be stuck looking back and thinking that it was just the good old days. I'm not going to be stuck looking back and saying, well, God used to do it this way. Or we used to have this kind of church or church used to happen like this or the Spirit of God used to move like that. I'm not going to be stuck in what God used to do. I'm proud about it. I stand on it. We're going to build on that foundation. But I believe that the greatest revival that God wants to give us is in the here and now. And if the Lord tarries, there's greater revival coming after all of us too. I love our past. I love this church. I love what it stands for. Do not misquote what I am saying. But I'm not going to be stuck looking back at the good old days. We're in the greatest days that the church has ever seen. Moses, the meekest of all men, author of five 
First five books in the Bible. He's the one that brought the law out, down off of Mount Sinai. He led God's chosen people right up to their promise. Mighty Moses. According to Deuteronomy 34, his eye wasn't dim nor his natural force abated. God didn't take him out because he wasn't strong enough anymore, couldn't see. Everything happens in God's timing. He wasn't blind. He had a strong body. But all things work for God's good. He died. Israel wept for 30 days. Then there is this. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. Joshua was full of spirit and wisdom and Israel hearkened unto him. Nobody is messing with Moses. Nobody is saying the past wasn't powerful. I am in no way, shape, or form ever claiming that I am anything close to a G.A. Mangan. I am nothing close to an Anthony Mangan. I would never, ever compare myself to those men. Nobody is saying that we can't hold dear to our past. But Deuteronomy ends by telling us, there arose not a prophet like unto Moses whom the Lord knew face to face. There wasn't anybody like Moses. But the next book, Joshua, begins by saying, after the death of Moses, the Lord spake to Joshua. And the very first thing he told him, Moses, my servant is dead. Arise, Joshua, and step into the promise. The past was powerful. I stand on that. That's our launching pad. I'm not belittling it, but I'm not going to be stuck in nostalgia. God's going to do great things here and now. God's going to do great things if he tarries in our future. The past was powerful and I love it. I love remembering the things that God has done. I love looking back and remembering how God healed and blessed and touched and restored. There's nothing wrong with looking back and saying, thank you, God, for what you've done for me. But I'm not going to live there. I'm going to live here and now. And I'm going to see you do something great in my present. I can't stay so focused on what God has done that I miss out on what God is doing. People can live in the past focusing on some positive event in their life and giving Him glory and honor. We should, but we can't stay stuck there. If we live and we build our house there, we'll absolutely miss what God is trying to do here and now. I know we are talking about letting go of the past this morning, but I'm going to shift just for a few moments, and I'm not much longer. We can also be so focused on the future that we can miss moments. We can't lose the power of what God wants to do now. I preached a sermon here probably a year ago, close to this date, on Lazarus. Use the whole stage. Mary and Martha, their brother Lazarus is in the tomb. We know the story very, very well. Mary says to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Martha says, I know he'll live again in the resurrection. One's living in the past. One's stuck too far in the future. But for the compassion of Jesus Christ, both were about to miss the miracle that he wanted to do then. Then. In the present. He said, I'm the resurrection. Then he claps with a loud voice. Lazarus, come forth and we know what happened. Let it go, Mary. Let it go, Martha. I want to do something supernatural in y'all's life now. Not if I had been here. Not when the resurrection takes place. I want to do something in your life today. Let go of the hurt. Let go of the pain. Let go of the heartache. Quit worrying about what the future holds. What does God want to do now? I'm closing. This is... Um, the hardest part to preach because I don't live it very well. I'll just be straight up with you. Perhaps the uh, greatest chain in keeping us bound to the past that keeps us from letting it go is in our failure to forgive. 
failure to forgive ourselves. Now, I, I understand there is but one that can forgive sin. I understand that. And He is faithful and just. If we confess, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. But we can forgive ourselves. Not of our sin, but I can forgive myself for a bad decision, a mistake, something in my past I'm not proud of. I can forgive myself. I don't have to live under the weight of that. I don't have to let that control me. I don't have to live under self-guilt and self-condemnation. I can look in the mirror and say, Gent, I forgive you. Let's move forward. Let's move on. It's hard to do, but we can do it. If I'm not willing to forgive myself, then I'm going to be beholden to my past and miss out on what God wants to do now. Failure to forgive ourselves and failure to forgive others. Whoo! I don't like it. That's tough. Holding grudges is easy. And let me be honest with you, sometimes I like it. You may not, but sometimes I do. Sometimes I wish evil on those people that have hurt me. Maybe not you, but I have. It's tough to forgive others. I like holding grudges way better. We're all very good at justifying our grudges. But Matthew chapter 6 says, when we pray, we are to say, forgive us our debts. I hate that word. As we forgive our debtors. I'm not sure this morning that's exactly how I want God to forgive me. Because when I think about it, I've probably been struggling with forgiving some of my debtors. And I can only be forgiving as I have forgiven my debtor. So I'm not sure that that's how I want to be forgiven this morning as I forgive everyone else. Because I been honest with you, I'm not real good at forgiveness. Christ's commentary fillets me wide open. If you forgive men their trespasses, that lets us know that man will hurt you. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Man, that's hard to stomach. That is so hard to stomach, and it's not written in black letters. That one's in red. <laughs> Matthew 18, 23 through 35 is the parable of the two debtors. So powerful is the principle in this parable that I personally believe it has the ability to bind up our prayers, to cut off the only connection between creature and creator. When ye stand praying, forgive if you have aught against any. The Amplified Version says if you have aught against anything or anybody. If you have aught against any, when you stand praying, forgive that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. How frightening is that scripture? To know that if I haven't forgiven somebody in my life, then there's still sin in my life. And how, if I'm sinful, can I have an ongoing conversation with the righteous King of kings and the Lord of lords? How can I have an open line of communication if I'm full of sin? And if I haven't forgiven somebody and I haven't been forgiven. Am I reading that right? I think so. 
Neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Paul drives the dagger a little bit deeper when he writes in Ephesians, Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Forgive as Christ has forgiven you. Ephesians 4.32. He tells the Colossians, bear with each other to forgive whatever grievances you may have one against the other. Forgive as the Lord, as the Lord forgave you. Colossians 3.13. It's the caveat that we fail to mention many times. We receive forgiveness in the same measure and manner that we offer it to others. No more, no less. So the devil and his opportunity to keep us, as I mentioned at the very beginning, trying to keep us from becoming who God wants us to be, he tries to trick us into making a memorial to some misunderstanding in our life. He wants us to mark the spot of some mistreatment. And that's tantamount to giving him a place to live in my head and in my heart. He has the ability to take me captive at his will if I can't let go of some past offense and forgive somebody. Here's a key to victorious living. Paul, once again, in Ephesians 4, 26, 27. When angry, don't sin. Don't ever let your wrath, your, ex, your exasperation, your fury, your indignation last until the sun goes down. The King James says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. We've got to get over the past and let it go. We've got to forgive, starting with ourselves and then our transgressors. Don't let the sun go down today on your wrath. We can't shut off our own flow of forgiveness. We can't sacrifice the present to the past. When we are tempted to build a stronghold over some experience or event around some person or place that's behind us, when we are tempted to harbor something in our hearts, we must instead turn to the truth, which states that great peace have they that love thy law. And nothing shall offend them. Forgive everyone for everything, everywhere, every time, and be free. Because that will get us out of the jail of the past. So thoroughly did Joseph learn this lesson that upon siring his first son, he insisted that he named him Manasseh, or in his meaning of his native tongue, God hath made me forget the toil of my father's house. It was so significant that he wanted everybody to know, I have forgotten everything that I've been through. I have for forgotten the past. I have forgotten the fact that my brothers sold me into slavery. I was put into prison. I had to live a hard, long 12 years all because my brothers didn't like me. It would have been very easy for Joseph to hold indignation and wrath against his family. But he named his son, God hath made me forget the toil of my father's house. He was still on the journey evidently when his second son was born. And he named him Ephraim, or God hath made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Hey, Paul, this is the precursor to all things work for my good. Joseph had acquired the most necessary of all powers, the ability to forget, to let go, to move on, and to realize that all things in my past have been working towards my present. He had the ability to prevent the past from sabotaging what God wanted to do in the here and now in his life. He refused to look back. 
And in the process of looking back, he would have lost what was before him. I have no doubt that everyone under the sound of my voice has that calling, that gifting, that ability to make a difference in the kingdom of God today, here and now. You didn't miss your chance, and it's not someday down the road. You can make a difference beginning today. You can let your gifting flow today. You can make a difference in our community today. Let's all stand together. The question about today, we have the opportunity to make a difference today. The question is, is it being hidden by our past? Are we allowing things from our past, a hurt, a pain, a mistake, a fault, a failure of our own? Somebody did something wrong to us, whatever it may be. Is there something in my past? Is there something in your past that is keeping us from being effective today? Are we looking... God has confirmed His Word before and after. That He's going to stand on His promises and give you hope for what God wants to do. And He's confirmed we got to let go of some things. Got to let go of some pain and some hurt in the past because there is hope for the future. You do have a promise to stand on. You do have a gifting. You do make a difference. You do matter in the kingdom of God. You are God is depending on you to make a difference in somebody's life out there. Do not let the past keep you from being what God called you to be today. Today. Don't miss out on today's love, today's blessing, today's mercy, today's forgiveness, today's power, today's strength. Don't miss it because of yesterday's hurt and agony and pain. If you would like to come get the weight of yesterday off your shoulders, I'd invite you forward. I'd invite you to the rail. I'd invite you to the second aisle. I know that there's been some massive hurts in the past. I know some of the pain that many of you are carrying. Come give it to Jesus this morning. Let it go today. Don't hold on to it any longer. Don't hold on to that hurt. Don't hold on to that painful memory any longer. Come turn it over to Jesus. It's been robbing you long enough. It's been stealing from you long enough. It's been trying to take away your effectiveness in God's kingdom in the here and now long enough. Come turn it over to Jesus today. Let it go. Let it go.
to those of you that are joining us by way of the web. It has been a tremendous honor having you today. Thank you for being a part. I believe in you, but more importantly, God believes in you. You have a destiny. You're ordained. You're called. You can be justified, leading to your glorification. But the enemy would love to keep you wrapped up in your past over some thing or hurt or mistake or person. I encourage you, let that go. It is under the blood of Jesus Christ. Go forgive somebody and move into the here and now and see what God wants to do in your life today. You don't have to be identified by your yesterdays. You can be identified by today and what God wants to do in your life. Thank you for being with us. It's been an honor to have you. We'll see you Wednesday night at 7, next Sunday morning at 10. God bless you and have a great Sunday in Jesus' name.